An actor who is well known in Hollywood for his charisma and talent, Warren Beatty, has had a life that is full of unexpected and fascinating turns. There were several obstacles on his path to success, including the fact that he turned down football scholarships and worked odd jobs in New York. Recently, there have been rumors that hint at a new challenge. As a result of the emergence of rumors regarding a strange health issue, fans and family members are concerned. The question is, what is the reality behind these rumors? Participate with us as we investigate the less well-known stories and make an effort to comprehend the actual circumstances that led to the rumored diagnosis of Warren Beatty. His birth took place on March 30, 1937 in Richmond, Virginia, and his name was Henry Warren Beatty. Due to the fact that his father, Ira Owens Beatty, was pursuing a career as a teacher and school administrator, his boyhood was distinguished by many movements. As time went on, the family eventually made their home in Arlington, Virginia, which is where Beatty's passion for movies really began to develop. Young Warren McLean was frequently brought to the theater by his elder sister, the famed actress Shirley McLean, and as a result, he developed a passion for the silver screen. The Philadelphia Story, which was released in 1940 and starred Katherine Hepburn, was a movie that really impacted him and will continue to do so. He found that Hepburn and his own mother shared a striking likeness, not just in terms of their physical appearance, but also in terms of their strong-willed personality. Love Affair, which was released in 1939 and starred Charles Boyer, was another film that struck a chord with him. He considered the film to be profoundly emotional, and it was this film that served as the basis for his own remake many years later. Since he was a child, Warren Beatty has always been fascinated by the public eye. Within the decade of the 1950s, he was a huge supporter of the Texaco Star Theater, which was a well-known variety show that was presented by the legendary comedian Milton Berle. As a result of Beatty's admiration for Burley's comedic style and stage appearance, he began to imitate the comedian, so establishing an impression of the comedian and his routines that was absolutely spot on. Early on, he showed an interest in comedy and performance, which provided a glimpse into his potential career in the entertainment sector. The encouragement to pursue a career in acting came from Beatty's sister, Shirley MacLaine, who had already established a name for herself in the Hollywood industry. But Beatty's aspirations extended far beyond the realm of acting. His desire to exert control over every facet of filmmaking was strong. He subsequently confessed that even in his early playing jobs, he couldn't help but provide comments on the script, lighting, and clothing, much to the frustration of some directors. He claimed that this was the case even when he was just starting out. Beatty's drive to develop a holistic perspective for his initiatives brought up his demand for control, which he felt was necessary. It wasn't just the performance that piqued his interest. As a filmmaker, he desired to be engaged in each and every stage of the production process. This goal would eventually materialize in his jobs as a writer, producer, and director, which would allow him to completely express his creative vision while also allowing him to maintain complete control over his work. During his time as a student at Washington Lee High School in Arlington, Beatty was able to become a member of the school's football team due to his outstanding performance in the sport. He was presented with a number of college football scholarships, but he declined them in order to pursue his interest in the arts instead. He joined the Sigma Chi fraternity and studied liberal arts at Northwestern University, where he also participated in the university's liberal arts program. However, after only one year of college, Beatty made the decision to withdraw from the program and relocate to New York City in order to pursue acting training with the legendary Stella Adler. Although it was a risky decision, he was resolute in his goal to establish himself as a prominent figure in the entertainment industry, much like his sister had done by following in her footsteps. For Beatty, life in New York was not an easy place to be. Because of his financial difficulties, he frequently subsisted on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in order to stay alive. He worked a variety of odd jobs such as cleaning dishes, playing the piano in bars, and even working as a sandhog for a short period of time, digging tunnels beneath the city surface. But despite everything that was going on, he never lost his concentration on his acting studies, where he was perfecting his craft and getting ready for his ultimate breakthrough in Hollywood. Warren Beatty's career started to pick up steam in the late 1950s when he began to make appearances on various television shows such as Studio One, Craft Television Theater, and Playhouse 90 that were broadcast on television. As a result of his performance as Milton Armitage, a recurrent character on the first season of the hit sitcom The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, he even became a regular on the show. 
Nevertheless, it was his performance on Broadway in the play A Loss of Roses by William Ung that gave the most convincing demonstration of his abilities. He was nominated for a Tony Award in the category of Best Featured Actor in a play for his performance as a young guy who falls in love with the mother of his best friend. Additionally, he was awarded a Theater World Award for his performance. Despite the fact that this was his sole appearance on Broadway, it was a crucial one that helped to establish his status as a rising star in the world of acting. In 1961, Beatty made his debut in the film industry with the critically acclaimed drama Splendor in the Grass, which was directed by Elia Kazan. He played a young man who was divided between his love for a girl and the pressures of society norms, and he acted alongside Natalie Wood in the film. The movie was a huge hit, and it earned Beatty a nomination for a Golden Globe in the category of Best Actor. Additionally, it won two Academy Awards. In addition to that, he was awarded the Golden Globe for Emerging Star of the Year. The Performer Beatty's career took a significant turn for the better when he worked with Kazan, a well-known filmmaker. His perception of Kazan was that of a guide and a father figure, someone from whom he could gain knowledge and appreciate. After some time had passed, during a memorial service held at the Kennedy Center in honor of Kazan, Beatty officially acknowledged the director's influence and credited him with providing him with the most significant break of his career. The connection that existed between Beatty and Kazan was nuanced and intricate. Despite the fact that they came from quite different places and had very distinct personalities, they had a common interest in filmmaking and a mutual respect for each other's abilities. After some time had passed, Kazan recalled his first impression of Beatty, in which he characterized him as a young guy who desired everything and wanted something his way. He recognized in Beatty a sharp intelligence, a lot of chutzpah, and an unwavering belief in his own capability abilities, particularly his sexual prowess. He was impressed by all of these qualities. According to Kazan, this self-assurance was something that women secretly appreciated. During the early stages of his career, Beatty appeared to follow the conventional Hollywood trajectory of a young actor who was both beautiful and had a penchant for the social scene. However, his role in Bonnie and Clyde 1967, a film that he co-produced, destroyed this image and exposed his actual potential as a director who is both diverse and original. It was written by Gerald Garrett, a movie columnist who is syndicated, that the image of Warren Beatty, a playboy who enjoyed having fun, had died out at the age of 28. It is the birth of Warren Beatty, a man in the film industry. In the years that followed his breakthrough performance in Splendor in the Grass, Beatty never stopped looking for jobs that were both tough and varied. In the drama The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone, which was released in 1961, he played a role alongside Vivian Lee. The story revolved around an aging actress who falls in love with a younger guy in Rome. In addition, he had roles in the films All Fall Down, 1962, Lilith, 1963, Promise Her Anything, 1964, Mickey One, 1965, and Kaleidoscope, 1966, all of which were directed by well-known directors such as John Frankenheimer, Robert Rawson, and Arthur Penn. Beatty further solidified his dedication to take charge of his own career and artistic vision by establishing his own production company in 1965. The company was named Tatira after his parents. Warren Beatty assumed the helm of his career at the tender age of 29, when he produced and starred in the landmark film Bonnie and Clyde, which was released in 1967. His idea for a picture that would challenge the traditions of Hollywood storytelling was embraced by all of the members of the creative team that he assembled, which included writers Robert Benton and David Newman, as well as director Arthur Penn. Faye Dunaway played the role of Bonnie Parker, Gene Hackman played Buck Barrow, Estelle Parsons played Blanche Barrow, Gene Wilder played Eugene Grizzard, and Michael J. Pollard played C.W. Moss. Beatty was responsible for selecting the cast by hand, and he assembled a remarkable ensemble that comprised all of these actors. It turned out that his intuition was right, as the chemistry between the cast members and their performances received plaudits from both the reviewers and the audience. Beatty's zeal and tenacity brought the project through to completion, despite the fact that the head of the company, Jack Warner, initially disregarded the film as being full of gangster-related content that was out of date. As the director, he was responsible for overseeing the script, advocating for the film's distinctive vision, and finally delivering a masterpiece that would alter the landscape of American cinema. 
There were 10 nominations for the Academy Award for the film Bonnie and Clyde, including nominations for Best Picture and Best Actor for Warren Beatty. The film was a commercial and critical triumph. Additionally, it was nominated for seven Golden Globes, including the awards for Best Picture and Best Actor. The investment that Beatty made in the movie was quite profitable, as he was able to make a cool $6 million from his 30% part of the revenues on the picture. Warren Beatty maintained his acting career after the enormous success of Bonnie and Clyde. He starred opposite the great Elizabeth Taylor in three films, The Only Game in Town, which was released in 1970, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which was released in 1971, and Dollars, which was released in 1971. Each picture demonstrated Beatty's versatility as an actor and his ability to adapt to a variety of genres, including romantic comedies, westerns, and crime dramas, among others. Beatty's interests, on the other hand, went well beyond the realm of the silver screen. Through the production of a series of benefit concerts in 1972, he was able to harness the might of Hollywood for political activism. These concerts were held in support of George McGovern's bid for the presidency. The first concert, Four for McGovern, held at the Forum in Los Angeles, featured an all-star lineup, including Barbara Streisand, Carole King, and James Taylor. It was a massive success, with Streisand even recording a live album from the event. Beatty followed up with another concert in Cleveland, where Joni Mitchell and Paul Simon joined James Taylor on stage. In June 1972, he organized an even bigger event, Together for McGovern, at Madison Square Garden in New York City. This star-studded concert featured the reunited Simon and Garfunkel, the comedic duo Nichols and May, folk legends Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the soulful Dionne Warwick. These concerts were groundbreaking, not only for their star power, but also for their impact on political fundraising and awareness. Beatty's ability to mobilize Hollywood celebrities for a political cause on such a grand scale was unprecedented, creating a new model for political engagement and activism. Campaign manager Gary Hart even credited Beatty with inventing the political concert. In 1974, he starred in Alan Pakula's political thriller, The Parallax View, and the comedy The Fortune with Mike Nichols. However, it was his next film, Shampoo, 1975, that truly showcased his creative prowess. Beatty not only starred in Shampoo, but he also co-wrote and produced the film, which was directed by Hal Ashby. This satirical comedy drama, set against the backdrop of the 1968 U.S. presidential election, explored themes of social change, political disillusionment, and the complexities of relationships. It was a critical success, earning four Academy Award nominations, including Best Original Screenplay and five Golden Globe nominations. In 1978, Beatty took on the challenge of directing, producing, writing, and starring in Heaven Can Wait. This romantic fantasy comedy, a remake of the 1941 film Here Comes Mr. Jordan, earned nine Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Director, Actor, and Adapted Screenplay. Beatty's performance as Joe Pendleton, a football player who was mistakenly taken to heaven before his time, was both charming and heartwarming, earning him a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor. But Beatty's ambition didn't stop there. In 1981, he released Reds, a sprawling historical epic about the life of American journalist John Reed and his involvement in the Russian Revolution. This film, a passion project for Beatty, had been in development for over a decade, and it was a massive undertaking, requiring extensive research and filming in multiple locations around the world. Despite the challenges, Reds was a critical and commercial success, earning 12 Academy Award nominations, including four for Beatty himself. He won the Oscar for Best Director, solidifying his reputation as a talented filmmaker with a unique vision. The film also won awards for Best Supporting Actress Maureen Stapleton and Best Cinematography. Following Reds, Beatty took a five-year break from acting, returning in 1987 with the comedy Ishtar. This film, written and directed by Elaine May, was a critical and commercial flop, despite its star-studded cast. However, the blame for the film's failure was largely placed on the studio's new British chief, David Putnam, who had publicly criticized the film before its release. Putnam was fired shortly after, but the damage to Ishtar's reputation was done. Under his production company, Mulholland Productions, Warren Beatty embarked on a new creative adventure in 1990, taking on the iconic comic book character, 
Dick Tracy. He not only starred as the square-jawed detective, but also directed and produced the film, showcasing his multifaceted talent and ambition. The movie was a visual feast, with vibrant colors and a stylized aesthetic that captured the essence of the classic comic strip. It was also a box office hit, earning critical acclaim and seven Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor for Beatty. The following year, Beatty produced and starred in the critically acclaimed film Bugsy, directed by Barry Levinson. He portrayed the real-life gangster, Bugsy Siegel, delving into the complexities of a man driven by ambition and consumed by his own desires. The film was a major success, earning 10 Oscar nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor, and ultimately winning two for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design. Beatty continued his streak of successful films with Love Affair 1994, a romantic drama that he co-wrote, produced, and starred in alongside his wife Annette Bening and the legendary Katherine Hepburn. However, this film didn't fare as well as his previous projects, receiving mixed reviews and failing to make a splash at the box office. Undeterred by this setback, Beatty returned to the director's chair in 1998 with the political satire Bullworth. He also wrote and starred in the film, delivering a sharp and insightful commentary on American politics and the corrupting influence of money and power. The film earned an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay and was hailed as a critical success. But Beatty's film career hit a roadblock after the poor box office performance of Town & Country 2001. He didn't appear in or direct another film for 15 years, a hiatus that sparked speculation about his future in the industry. However, he didn't completely disappear from the spotlight. He continued to be involved in various projects, including a lawsuit against Tribune Media over the rights to the Dick Tracy character. In 2011, after a decade-long legal battle, Beatty emerged victorious, proving his determination and tenacity even outside of the film world. This legal victory seemed to reignite his passion for filmmaking as he returned to the director's chair in 2016 with the film Rules Don't Apply, a romantic comedy drama set in the golden age of Hollywood. In 2010, Warren Beatty donned the fedora once again to play Dick Tracy in a 30-minute television special that aired on TCM. This unique special blurred the lines between fiction and reality, featuring a metafictional interview with Dick Tracy himself and film critic Leonard Maltin. The show explored the history and creation of the iconic detective, with Tracy even offering his own opinions on Beatty's portrayal of him in the 1990 film. But there was more to this special than just a fun interview. By producing and starring in it, Beatty cleverly managed to retain the rights to the Dick Tracy character, ensuring he could continue to explore the world of the iconic detective in future projects. In 2016, Beatty confirmed his intention to make a sequel to Dick Tracy, but the project has yet to materialize. However, in 2023, he surprised fans by reprising the role of Tracy in a follow-up special called Dick Tracy Special, Tracy Zooms In, which also aired on TCM. This time around, Tracy engaged in a Zoom interview with Ben Mankiewicz and Leonard Maltin, where he hilariously criticized aspects of the 1990 film adaptation, and even suggested that a younger actor should take over the role. In the mid-1970s, Warren Beatty's fascination with the enigmatic Howard Hughes led him to sign a deal with Warner Brothers to develop a film about the reclusive billionaire. Beatty initially planned to tackle two ambitious projects back-to-back, -back, a film about the life of journalist John Reed, which would eventually become Reds, and a biopic on Hughes. However, as he delved deeper into the Reed project, it consumed his focus, and the Hughes film was put on hold. But Beatty's interest in Hughes never waned. In June 2011, it was announced that he would finally bring the story to life, not as a straightforward biopic, but as a fictionalized romantic comedy set in 1958 Hollywood in Las Vegas. This film, eventually titled Rules Don't Apply, would explore an affair between a young actress and her driver, both employed by the eccentric Hughes. During this period, Beatty embarked on a whirlwind casting process, meeting with a slew of talented actors for his ensemble cast. The list included rising stars like Andrew Garfield and Alec Baldwin, established actors like Owen Wilson and Justin Timberlake, and even Hollywood legends like Jack Nicholson. The film, released in 2016, was a labor of love for Beatty, who had been working on the project for over four decades. He not only directed and produced the film, but also starred as Howard Hughes, bringing his own unique interpretation to the enigmatic figure. 
The film also featured a stellar cast, including his wife, Annette Bening, Matthew Broderick, Candace Bergen, Ed Harris, and Martin Sheen. It was his first film in 15 years, and he not only directed and produced it, but also starred as the enigmatic billionaire. Despite the buzz surrounding the film, it was met with mixed reviews and a disappointing box office performance. Critics found it to be self-indulgent and overly long, while audiences failed to connect with the quirky characters and convoluted plot. It was a setback for Beatty, who had poured his heart and soul into the project. However, in 2017, Beatty and his Bonnie and Clyde co-star, Faye Dunaway, had a chance to redeem themselves on the biggest stage in Hollywood, the Academy Awards. They were invited to present the Best Picture Award, a moment that was supposed to be a celebration of their iconic film's 50th anniversary, but things took an unexpected turn when they were handed the wrong envelope, leading Dunaway to mistakenly announce La La Land as the winner, instead of the actual winner, Moonlight. The blunder, dubbed Envelope Gate, quickly became a viral sensation, dominating headlines and social media. Despite the initial embarrassment and chaos, Beatty and Dunaway handled the situation with grace and humor. They even returned to the Oscars the following year to present the Best Picture Award again, this time without any mishaps. The audience gave them a standing ovation, a testament to their resilience and ability to laugh at themselves. The Envelope Gate incident was a reminder that even the most meticulously planned events can go awry and that even Hollywood legends aren't immune to making mistakes but it also showed that sometimes the most memorable moments are the ones that don't go according to plan. A woman from Louisiana named Christina Charlotte Hirsch has accused actor Warren Beatty of doing bad things to her when she was 14 and 15 years old in 1973, according to a piece of filed in a Los Angeles courtroom on Monday. Hirsch is now in her mid-60s. She says Beatty, who has won important awards for his acting and filmmaking, hurt her in a way that's not okay, and she's asking for money to help her. Hirsch is using a special rule in California that lets people talk about old times when they were hurt as kids if they didn't say anything before, because they couldn't because of the rules. Beatty's real name isn't on the piece of paper, but she calls him Defendant Doe, and says he was a famous actor who was almost famous for being in the movie Bonnie and Clyde. In the paper she filed, Hirsch says she met Beatty in 1973 when she was 14, and he was about 35 years old. They met at a movie set. Beatty kept looking at Hirsch and telling her she was pretty, and when she visited Los Angeles he asked her to call him. Hirsch felt very happy because he was showing her attention. After their first meeting, Hirsch called Beatty and they talked a lot over the rest of the year. When she was 14 and 15 years old, Hirsch says Beatty took her to his hotel and did things like driving her around, helping her with her schoolwork, and talking about when she would lose her virginity. According to the papers, Beatty later started to do more than just talk. Hirsch says this was wrong because she was too young to say yes and it's against the rules. Hirsch has had trouble finding a lawyer to help her with her case, she shared in an interview. Since July, she has tried to keep moving forward, but some bad things have made it hard. In August, she was attacked by a group of people who used meth, and she had to use a knife to protect herself. The police from Santa Monica found her and let her go five days later. Hirsch mentioned in her papers that she had to ask the FBI to do a few more things because of Beatty and his friends who might not be acting nicely. At the start of the case, a person named Rec talked to Hirsch, hired someone to help prove her story, and spoke with a mental health professional. The mental health professional agreed that Hirsch's claims were good and valid. In her interview and papers, Hirsch said the people who were supposed to help her wanted her to accept money, about $130,000. They wanted to take 40% of it for themselves. Hirsch didn't want to do that and wanted them to fight in court. A man named Judge Edward B. Morton Jr. said no to her case on Friday, meaning she can't talk about it again. However, he realized that Beatty hadn't been told about the problem. Later, on December 21st, he changed his mind and said she might be able to talk about it again. Warren Beatty and Annette Bening, a Hollywood power couple with a long-lasting marriage, have always been a subject of fascination. But the story of how Bening captured the heart of Tinseltown's notorious playboy is particularly intriguing. When Beatty met Benning, shortly before filming the 1991 crime drama Bugsy, he was smitten. He even told the director that he wanted to marry her, a shocking declaration for a man known for his numerous flings. While they kept things professional on set, 
Beatty later admitted that falling for Benning took mere minutes. He described feeling both elated and nostalgic, as if a chapter of his life was closing. Benning's charm lay in her authenticity. According to her mother, Beatty was drawn to her because she didn't act like a typical Hollywood actress. She was down to earth and true to herself. However, Beatty's reputation as a ladies' man preceded him. Author Peter Biskin claimed in his unauthorized biography that Beatty had slept with an astonishing 12,775 women. While Beatty denied this outrageous figure, he did admit to having numerous high-profile romances with stars like Natalie Wood, Joan Collins, Madonna, and Diane Keaton. Despite Warren Beatty's reputation as a Hollywood playboy, Annette Bening wasn't bothered by his past. In an interview with Mirror, she expressed her admiration for him, saying, It was clear that their connection went beyond his reputation, as Benning saw the charm and charisma that had captivated so many women before her. Interestingly, a year before their love story unfolded on the set of Bugsy, Beatty had actually wanted to cast Benning as his leading lady in the 1991 comic book adaptation Dick Tracy. He had arranged a meeting with her, but she never showed up. Beatty later learned that she had flown to New York to support her ex-husband during a difficult time, a gesture that impressed him deeply. It turns out that Benning's agent had advised her to avoid the meeting with Beatty, fearing that he might try to make a move on her. But fate had other plans, and they eventually crossed paths on the set of Bugsy, where their romance blossomed. Interestingly, Beatty's last known girlfriend before Benning was none other than Madonna, who starred in Dick Tracy as the seductive, breathless Mahoney. It's safe to say that the chemistry on set would have been explosive if Benning had taken the role. Beatty, who had a reputation for being a lifelong bachelor, finally settled down with Benning in 1992. He admitted in an interview that his reluctance to marry wasn't about avoiding commitment, but rather avoiding divorce. He had seen the pain and heartache that divorce could cause, and he wanted to make sure he was with the right person before taking the plunge. When he met Benning, he knew she was the one. He told Entertainment Weekly, I think there was a moment of hesitation on her part. The rule was broken. Despite the naysayers, Warren Beatty and Annette Benning's marriage proved to be a surprising success. They tied the knot in a private ceremony on March 3, 1992, just two months after welcoming their first child, Stephen. However, their union wasn't without its share of speculation and scrutiny. Benning's friends and family were initially shocked and worried when she announced her engagement to Beatty. After all, he was known for his playboy ways and his string of high-profile romances. Benning's sister even described it as the big issue of that moment. The couple's 22-year age difference also raised eyebrows, but Benning dismissed any concerns, stating that she had always been attracted to older men. Their marriage seemed to defy the odds, but rumors of trouble in paradise surfaced in 2010. While Benning was promoting her film, The Kids Are Alright, reporters were instructed not to ask her about Beatty or their four children. This unusual request sparked speculation that the couple was facing difficulties behind closed doors. Reporters were ordered not to question about Beatty or their children during interviews for Benning's film The Kids Are All Right in the year 2010, which led to the spread of allegations that Beatty and Benning were having problems in paradise. However, according to a source who spoke with the New York Post, this embargo has only served to fuel speculation about an imminent breakup. Beatty and Benning were allegedly at conflict with one another over their teenage daughter Kathleen's choice to transition, according to a report that was published in the National Enquirer. This narrative added fuel to the fire of the rumors. The newspaper reported that Beatty was utterly heartbroken by the news, which added gasoline to the fire of conjecture of a possible rupture among the family. A recent conversation between Beatty and Kathleen, who is now known by the name Stephen Era, took place. Their revolutionary genius child, along with all of their children, is a source of pride for them. The members of the family encourage and support one another's professional endeavors. For 15 years, Beatty took a sabbatical from the public eye in order to devote his time to being a wonderful father to their four children. During that time period, Benning appeared in a number of widely recognized films, including The American President, American Beauty, and 20th Century Women, among others. This was the first time that Beatty and Baining had appeared on screen together since the film Love Affair, which was released in 1994. Years later, in 2016, they reunited for the film Rules Don't Apply. 
Baining is of the opinion that their professional lives are not a contest. Ever since they tied the knot, she has been concentrating on making approximately one film every year. As they continue their adventure in Hollywood, it is a wonderful way for them to continue working together and supporting one another. Warren Beatty's recent departure from public life has given rise to concerns regarding his health. This is especially true in light of the fact that he was unable to attend his daughter, Ella's Broadway premiere in the play Appropriate in March of 2024, which was a big milestone in her career. Warren's absence was apparent, which fueled speculation about his well-being. His wife, Annette Benning, passionately supported Ella from the audience, but Warren was not there. It has been brought to the attention of In Touch by sources close to the family that Warren has been experiencing difficulties with his health, however the particulars of his ailment have not been released. The fact that he chose to avoid the spotlight and not attend the performance of his daughter has caused widespread concern among his followers and prompted inquiries over the severity of his health problems. She acknowledged the pleasure of having famous parents while emphasizing her resolve to make her own impact in the industry, despite the fact that Warren Beatty was not present for his daughter Ella's debut on Broadway. His persistent absence from public events, on the other hand, has given rise to rumors and suspicion regarding his health. People who work in the entertainment industry are worried, particularly because he hasn't been seen walking the red carpet in more than two years. The most recent significant public appearance that Beatty made was at the 2017 Academy Awards, where he and Faye Dunaway made the infamous mistake of announcing the winner of the Best Picture Award. This was first attributed to Beatty, however it was later discovered that it was actually a production blunder, namely a mix-up with the envelopes. There are some alarming revelations about Beatty's health that have been communicated by sources close to him. In April of 2024, a source close to him disclosed that he is weak and still extremely vain, and that he does not wish to be seen in public owing to the fact that his health is deteriorating. According to a different source, Beatty is showing signs of increased forgetfulness, which raises concerns about his cognitive ability. The fact that he has been absent from public events for an extended period of time, in addition to following these insider allegations, has caused a sense of concern among his followers and colleagues. Even while the specifics of his health are kept confidential, the rumors and worries that have been circulating about him bring to light the dangers of becoming older and the inevitable deterioration that even Hollywood giants must